to have Mr. Raymond Winter with from the uh, Office of the Attorney General here with us today, sir. Good afternoon, Madam Presiding Officer, Commissioners. You've got a few items on your agenda today for your consideration in the way of enforcement matters. The first item for your consideration concerns Aaron Olson, who was a telecommunicator in Wiley Police Department. Uh, Mr. Olson received a conviction for DWI, a Class B misdemeanor, and he failed to respond to notice of the ex executive director's enforcement proceedings, consequently defaulting on his opportunity for a contested case hearing. <clears throat> the executive director, in light of that action, recommends entry of a default order suspending Mr. Olson's license for 10 years. Commissioner Hester. Uh, I'll make a motion that the commission accept and adopt the recommendations of the executive director to enter a final default order to suspend the license of Aaron Olson. We have a motion and a second. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes, sir. Commissioners, the next individual before you is Donald R. Buckram. He likewise received a conviction for DWI, only this was over a .15 BAC, resulting in a Class A misdemeanor instead of a B. Uh, the uh, respondent, Mr. Buckram, has agreed to the suspension recommended by the executive director, which is a 10-year suspension, and that is before you today. Commissioner Hester. I make a motion that we accept and adopt the recommendations of the executive director and to enter a final agreed suspension waiver for Donald Buckram. We have a motion second. and a second. Any further discussion or questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes, sir. Commissioners, the next individual before you is Percy Williams, Jr., who received a conviction for cruelty to animals, a Class A misdemeanor. Mr. Williams uh, entered into negotiations with the executive director staff, and they do have a proposed agreed order suspending his license for a period of 10 years. Uh, the first three years would be a fully served term of suspension followed by seven years probated. Commissioner Hester. I move that, that we accept and adopt the recommendation of the executive director to enter a final agreed suspension order for Percy Williams. Okay. We have a motion. Second. And a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Commissioners, the next item on your agenda concerns Justin Cobb. Uh, Mr. Cobb received deferred adjudication for the offense of assault family violence, a Class A misdemeanor. Uh, he did request an opportunity to have a contested case hearing at SOA where the matter was docketed. Uh, the Attorney General, on behalf of the Executive Director, moved for summary disposition in the matter. And the Administrative Law Judge, upon review of our motion for summary disposition, granted it, resulting in a proposal for a decision, which is before you today, recommending revocation of Mr. Cobb's peace officer license, a gender license. Uh, Mr. Cobb has now retained counsel, uh, and Mr. Cobb and counsel are present and would like to address the commission. The executive director does recommend approval of the proposal for decision and entry of an order revoking Mr. Cobb's license. And my colleague, Mr. Savage, uh, is available to respond to any questions that the commission may have after hearing from the respondent and his counsel. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask that um, both of you please uh, identify yourselves uh, and also spell your names so we have that for the record, please. Amanda Bolin, last name is B-O-L-I-N, attorney for Justin Cobb. Okay. Justin Cobb, J-U-S-T-I-N-C-O-B-B. Please. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. I'm a bit late to the game, um, as you heard 
from the Attorney General's office. I have only recently been retained and I am uh, proud to be here on behalf of Justin Cobb sitting here to my left. Um, he is a 28 year old father of a small child. He attended the University of Houston Police Academy, completed that in 2016 and received his peace officer license that same year. Went on to serve as a peace officer with the Iowa Colony Police Department and then with the Manville Police Department. I'm late to the game because I'm here at this stage sitting in front of you now, um, and I can almost assure you had I been involved from the beginning, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. Uh, and I will explain to you why I think that that is the case. Um, and I'm sure that you've had the opportunity to review some of the filings and the exhibits in this case. So I'm not gonna waste your time with going through a chronology of events and, and all of that. Um, but I can tell you that I am, very familiar with and aware of Rule 223.19C. I'm aware of it, I understand the ramifications of it. Unfortunately, um, my client was given bad legal advice um, on many fronts. Um, and so at the time that he entered into the plea on this criminal case, he was operating under a misunderstanding based on legal advice as to the ramifications of that rule which I will address um, a little bit more in a moment. Um, but first, I do ask that you take a look at the details of this case. Uh, I know that I am speaking to a commission who's obviously very familiar with incidents like domestic violence and with the prosecution of criminal cases. And so I ask that you take a look at it because this is a case that probably should have never even been prosecuted. Um, this is a case that on scene, the patrol officer chose not to make an arrest um, he termed it as a he said, she said, uh, put in his police report that he was unable to determine who the primary aggressor was, um, observed and photographed injuries to my client who maintained that the altercation was one in which he acted in self-defense. Later, that same complaining witness refused to continue to cooperate with the investigation. And it was not a situation where she was back with him like we typically see in domestic violence. It was one where she simply just didn't want to cooperate with the investigation. I think there should be some consideration given to those facts of this case, that it's one that should have never landed in court, but it did. And so that really brings the bigger issue for Mr. Cobb. He had a, a well-respected, well-known criminal defense attorney, but not someone who took either the time to research or look into the collateral consequences for a police officer when it comes to a charge like domestic violence. And that is basically he was told and legally advised that because he was being placed on a deferred adjudication, it would not have drastic collateral consequences for his peace officer license, which obviously according to the existing rules, there, there are drastic, extremely drastic and permanent consequences even with being placed on a deferred for domestic violence. You know, it's, it's clear what the rule says, um, but I think we also have to look at the fact that uh, when a person pleads guilty, which Mr. Cobb did plead guilty to that offense, even though he was not found guilty or convicted, um, for a guilty plea to be consistent with our due process rights, it has to be one that is entered into knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily. Um, to be a voluntary plea, it cannot be one that's induced by misrepresentations. And that's exactly what happened in this instance. He was misled regarding the direct consequences of his plea, which is different than some cases you see in case law where the person maintains that they just simply didn't know of the consequences of their plea. Instead, he was directly misled regarding the consequences of his plea. And therefore, it's my position that his due process rights were violated, and now he has a permanent lifetime consequence if his license was to be revoked. So I know what I'm asking of you today is extraordinary, um, but I think it is a unique situation where we have an individual who was misadvised regarding his actions and also dealing with a case that it should have never landed in a court to begin with. And so it is our request that in your discretion as a commission, you don't approve this request. That instead, if you see fit to issue a suspension, even a lengthy suspension, uh, that Mr. Cobb can certainly suffer the consequence of that, but not at his young age and otherwise clean record 
to have his license permanently and for the rest of his life revoked. Mr. Cobb, we would like to hear from you, sir. He tells me he doesn't necessarily have anything specific, but we're both happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Just assumed Commissioner Astor was going to have something <laughs> to say. Commissioner Burris? Uh, I don't want to drag this out any longer than it needs to be. You know, this was in our packet last <coughs> for the last meeting. Um, and so we reviewed it then, it's in our packet again, we reviewed it again. I mean, clearly there are statutory considerations here um, that we can't ignore. Um, you are not, you are prohibited, you know, from, from having your license. Um, it is not lost on us. We read everything, we read the reports and um, it is not lost on us that, that this started out as a third degree felony and that it got busted down to a class A misdemeanor. Um, you had uh, the opportunity every step of the way to have counsel represent you from your union to the criminal case to this case and you failed to respond or um, plead your innocence. You know, you have the right to take it to trial. And um, as law enforcement specifically, ignorance the law is really no excuse to law enforcement. Um, on top of that, even if we said, we're gonna ignore all of that and throw it out the window, um, with your conviction, you know, with a domestic violence conviction, the statute says you're prohibited from carrying firearms. So I'm not sure how you would propose to do your job. Um, May I respond to that, that specifically? Uh, I think it's clear what my, my position on this is, and I, um, I don't have any other comments to make. Madam Chair, may I respond? Yes, ma'am. I just want to clarify one thing. This is not a conviction. Um, it was a deferred adjudication probation that my client has already successfully completed and been discharged from. So it is not a conviction that is on his record. Um, and the only other thing that I would add is that I, I completely agree that ignorance of the law is no excuse. The difference here for Mr. Cobb is that it was not ignorance, it was being misadvised and um, receiving misrepresentations from legal counsel, not just completely turning a blind eye and not looking at what the rules were. <clears throat> Commissioners, any other questions or, yes sir. Mr. Cobb, were you not aware of the rules regarding a uh, plea of guilty or deferred adjudication regarding your license? Uh, yes, sir, I was. Or may I respond to that? Were you referring to taking the deferred? I'm sorry? Were you referring to me taking the plea deal for the deferred? Yes. Uh, no, sir, I was advised by my attorney that it was going to be handled in a different way, that he didn't know the effects that it was going to have against my license, and he advised me this was the path I needed to take. Commissioner Hester? Was, was counsel there for the PFD? Uh, we, we, uh, it was all done uh, electronically uh, with SOA, but uh, Mr. Uh, Cobb never responded to any notices that were sent okay. to him uh, in the course of this administrative proceeding. Uh, he was, uh, the, with one exception, and that is the petition itself. Mr. Cobb responded to the petition and issued a general denial uh, pro se. Uh, when engaging him to pursue a contested case proceeding at his request, he did not respond at the same address that he had on file uh, that he responded at. Uh, the ALJ uh, issued an order granting the motion for summary disposition uh, and issued a letter that was sent to his address. He did not respond to that. Uh, the ALJ gave him additional time for exceptions and he did not respond to that either. Uh, so 
uh, at this juncture. Uh, that's the first time we've heard of an attempt to collaterally attack the underlying basis of the um, deferred adjudication. Uh, I would point uh, uh, the commissioners to the packet if there are any questions. Uh, but the deferred adjudication paperwork is fairly clear. Uh, Mr. Uh, Cobb did indeed uh, ex uh, go through a Boykin process, as you would expect in any criminal matter. Obviously, a collateral attack in administrative proceeding isn't uh, entirely uh, the way administrative law is, is set up. But uh, in this case, just for reference, uh, he did indicate uh, to the judge, the judge made a finding that his plea was free voluntarily executed uh, and uh, knowingly made that he was represented by counsel uh, and that he was aware of the consequences of his plea. Uh, and the documentation containing both the judge's finding and the um, agreement to that particular provision is contained in the packet uh, in his stipulations, waivers, and admissions. Thank you. Um, yeah. this, this met everything required by procedure. I don't see there's any um, errors in it. Um, I would make a motion to um, accept the recommendation. Let me, let me let me do one thing. Do you have um, Ms. Bowen? Do you or your client have any other comments? Uh, Madam Chair, the only thing that I would add, um, based on uh, counsel's representations, is I agree that the documentation for the deferred adjudication has all the boxes checked off and listed for making. Um, a knowing, intelligent, and voluntary um, plea. However, the the knowledge that he had been induced by misrepresentations was not something he knew of at that time. Um, he did not know that he had received false legal advice from his criminal attorney at that time. That only became known once he received the petition to revoke his license and after the fact. So while I do agree that at the time, a judge made those findings. There was no way to know at those at that time, at least, that a petition would be filed and that he had acted on on bad legal advice. Mr. Winter, do you all have any further comments or? Uh, no, Madam Chair, we don't. We, we believe the record uh, speaks for itself. Uh, and as my colleague, Mr. Savage, says, there were numerous opportunities throughout the contested case hearing process for Mr. Cobb to have asserted uh, an argument like we're hearing today. Uh, but after responding to the initial petition and saying he wanted a contested case hearing, he failed to respond to any further communications from either our office or from the administrative law judge. And that included our motion for summary disposition to begin with. He had an opportunity to respond to that and he did not. It included the administrative law judge's initial reaction to that motion saying that she had received no response and that she intended to grant it. It included 60 days after that, the administrative law judge's issuance of the proposal for decision, actually making the recommendation that is before you today. And it further included a, yet another communication from the administrative law judge notifying all the parties of the time period for any exceptions to the proposal for decision had expired. And again, there was no response from Mr. Cobb to any of those communications, either from our office or from the administrative law judge. So in sum and substance, we, we stand by the recommendation on behalf of the executive director to enter the order revoking Mr. Cobb's license. I just had one question of, of Mr. Cobb, and I'm coming from the academy teaching instruction. Were you taught the TCO rules in the academy? Um, I do not recall offhand. I know we went over it in a little bit, but I'm um, 100% sure I'm not, I don't recall. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Cobb, I do have one question. Why didn't you respond to all of these requests for information? Uh, at the time that I received the letter, I wasn't financially stable enough to retain an attorney to make a response. Um, the letter doesn't specify in my knowledge from what I understood from reading it, how to make a response and what I needed to state in my response to them. And without having the funds to retain an attorney, I just didn't take another step forward with the matter. Did you have an attorney before these letters were received by you? Yes, previously, before I received letters, I did. And when I 
approached him to assist me with the uh, matters through T. Cole. He returned it down. He said he wasn't, that wasn't his field of expertise, so he didn't want to touch it. And so you didn't do anything? No, sir. I didn't have the funds to attain another attorney. Mr. Winter, does the Office of the Attorney General have any other further comments? Okay, okay I uh, make a motion to accept the recommendation of the proposal for decision. I second. We have a motion and a second. Any further questions or discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Based on the vote here today, the decision stands. Mr. Winter, if you will continue. Commissioners, the remaining items on your agenda in the disciplinary section are all for information purposes only. Uh, there are there is one statutory suspension of an individual who was charged with a felony uh, and received deferred adjudication resulting in an automatic 30-year term of suspension there are two statutory revocations individuals who were convicted of felony offenses resulting by operation of law of statutory revocations in addition to those uh, line items there are a number of individuals who have voluntarily surrendered their peace officer and jailer licenses uh, and those suspend, uh, surrenders have been accepted by the executive director. And then finally, for your information, there are listed a number of individuals who have received reprimands from the executive director for administrative violations, such as failing to report an arrest. But no further action is required of the commission for any of these matters. Any questions on any of those? Thank you very much, sir. It's good to see you. Good to see you, Madam Chair. We are going to go to agenda item number 12, which is receiving public comment on any topic without action. And do we have anyone for staff, do we have anyone signed up to speak that I don't have a card on? Yes, sir, if you'll please come up and have a seat and state your name and also spell it for the record. And then the floor is yours, sir. Is that live? There we go. Robert Armbruster, and I'm here just as an individual and not speaking for any organization. Uh, I understand there's some consideration before the commission about traveling the commission to different parts of the state for, for hearings. I, over the more than 25 years I've been coming here, I always hear about the lack of funds for different endeavors you have at the commission that your budget is always so tight. And I would imagine when the commission travels, with all the people you have to take with you today, that the, the cost would be overwhelming to your budget if you did that several times during the year with IT folks and all that. And I just thought I'd bring to your, to your attention that maybe you should look at having some way for people through the IT process to be able to address the commission through Zoom or whatever to have a face-to-face -face instead of having to travel the whole commission and staff and everything else and lose productivity, to have that available for people to do that. In addition, you might consider maybe two commissioners and the executive director or some of the other directors in the commission to travel throughout the state where you have your agents uh, in your field offices to be able to take questions or concerns or comments and then bring those back to the commission where you wouldn't have to have public meetings and televise those things that would then increase the cost, excuse me, to the commission. So just my thoughts on that topic and, and I know you want to be able to 
service the community and your stakeholders throughout the state. But there is a cost factor, and with IT today, we have another tool that we can spread yourself out uh, and be more available and have better communication. So those are just my thoughts. Thank you very much for the time. I appreciate it. And I'll spell my last name, A-R-M-B-R-U-S-T-E-R. -E Thank you very much. Let me ask if any of the commissioners have any questions. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. We are now going to go to agenda item number 13, which is executive session. And we will be going into a brief executive session. Uh, welcome anyone to stay. I would anticipate that we would be back shortly uh, to complete the last two items on the agenda. Um, 